This is Death Drive Dialectics. I'm Nicholas Tolliver, here with Tyler Mraz. Today we are speaking to Professor Todd McGowan, host of the Y Theory podcast with Ryan Angley, and author of many excellent books such as Emancipation After Hegel, The Impossible David Lynch, and Capitalism and Desire. Uh, Todd is a philosopher who draws inspiration from thinkers such as Lacan, Freud, Marx, and Hegel and creates accessible philosophical works that reach beyond the confines of academic discourse. Todd McGowan recently published a new book called Enjoyment Right and Left about politics and Jewissance. Todd, thank you so much for coming here to talk to us about politics, enjoyment, and so much more. It's my absolute pleasure. Thank, thanks for having me. Yeah, so the one thing, well, we liked many things about your recent book, but the one thing we particularly liked about it was its use of Lacanian concepts, such as enjoyment, uh, to directly analyze politics from a leftist perspective, something that we we continuously try to, try to do here on the channel. Uh, you outline two different forms of political enjoyment, left-wing and right-wing. These forms of enjoyment are basically two different responses to the same contradiction inherent to society. On one hand, on the one hand, right-wing politics attaches itself to belonging and enjoys through the erection of an enemy or the subject of non-belonging. Uh, while left politics occupies and in, and directly enjoys the position of non-belonging. Uh, you call right-wing politics a sort of derivative, uh, whereas left-wing politics is a more direct experience of, of enjoyment or, or, yeah. But uh, for, so for those viewers who have not read your book and might not be familiar with Lacanian concepts, this idea of uh, enjoying through non-belonging might sound pretty counterintuitive or maybe esoteric. Uh, could you just give a rundown of what non-belonging is and how exactly one could enjoy through it? Sure. I, I think that in a, in a way, I, I'm not, I was trying not to be conceptual, actually, in that description, like that idea that I, my, my idea was, okay, what creates a sense of belonging? Like what creates a sense that you belong to a certain group or a certain identity, certain society? Well, it's it's only you're only assured of that, or you only feel secure in that, and even then you don't really feel secure through the identification of something other, something outside an enemy. And so the philosopher Carl Schmidt thinks that every political grouping depends on this friend, what he calls a friend enemy distinction. So people that are inside and people are outside. And 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 so it seemed to me that, and I think this is. Lacan, I think, does get to this in a certain way, and I'll try to explain that in a second. But I, it seemed to me that th there was no such thing as belonging if belonging relies on someone external to you that doesn't belong, right? So then it, there's a, there's this contradiction that ends up undermining all belonging. So the idea that you would enjoy non-belonging would just follow from that because there's no such thing as enjoying belonging, right? Like there's no, if, if there is no belonging, then you can't ever enjoy your belonging. And so the way that I think Lacan gets this, I think that he maps it onto what he sees as sexual difference. And I, I think his formulation for masculine sexuality may be attached to this idea of belonging, but I think that his the way that he considers feminine sexuality, which he describes as the the the, the sexuality of what he calls the not all, which means it can never be made into a whole group. And I think that does. I think that nicely maps onto this idea of non-belonging. So that's the point at which I would see an overlap with Lacan's thinking, just in this term of, of feminine sexuality. Even though, I mean, I think it's I think if you're thinking in political terms, I would want to divorce it from any sexual like that's that's meaningless to me. I don't I don't care about that. But I think the way that he thinks about what he calls feminine sexuality does capture this idea of non-belonging with this idea of the not all where you can never form your group is never solidified as a whole and i think that's the difference and then i think the idea is that that's the only possible enjoyment to have because the other thing doesn't exist right that's why i think the mapping on the sexes doesn't really totally work yeah i, yeah. I think it's important how you describe it not as a conceptual thing or that enjoyment itself just defaults to non-belonging it's not like a competition between enjoyment of belonging correct and correct that's the key thing tyler yeah that's absolutely right yeah. and it seems like enjoyment is, is you know deeply connected to universality that you know right. only the right. position of non-belonging is the position of the universal right. there's a hegelian perspective side right. right absolutely right i mean i think hegel is my 
my main influence. And I, I mean, he would never put it in the terms of belonging and non-belonging. So that in that way, it's a kind of bastard as <laughs> bastard child of Hegel and Lacan, right? But uh, for sure, Nick's reference to the universal is absolutely important. Like non-belonging is inherently universal because that's the position that all of us are necessarily in. And belonging is an attempt to forge a particular identity that excludes that universe. Like you don't, I'm going to be secure in my particular identity by belonging to it. And I'm going to exclude the other particular, but that other particular, if it's the position of non-belonging, that's actually universal. So there's no way to, so I think it, it is, that's how I think that leftist politics is tied to universality because non-belonging is universality. If leftist or emancipatory politics is tied to non-belonging, then it's, it's universal in its struggle in a way that, right-wing politics is always particular, right? Like there's always, you know, like think about, I don't know, what's the most recent issue, some anti-trans campaign or whatever, mm -hmm. right? It's always, there's this enemy that we have to weed out and we, you know, they're the ones that don't belong, we belong and, and mm -hmm. all of us who are, I don't know what, all of us who are anti-trans, I don't know how else to describe yeah. it, the, the pro side of that position, even though it's anti. So I think that's the, that's the, that the, there is a way in which, universality uh, is aligned with non-belonging and particularism is aligned with the attempt to belong. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think um, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a good response and it gives us a good, we meant that question is like a, a rundown on the book and sure, you, sure. you, you explain the most important parts, but, but yeah, you want to get into the next question, Nick? Yeah. One thing I wanted to touch on your reference to, sexual difference really highlights, you know, where we were going with our next question, which is, are there any other forms of political enjoyment other than left and right wing enjoyment? Or in a, is it binary um, in the same way, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's, I don't think the, the my quick answer is no, there are no other forms, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's binary. Like, I don't think it's, I don't think that it's a binary opposition because it's an opposition in which one side doesn't exist. So it's dialectical, right? Like that, mm. that the, that the, 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 for, the universal form comes out of the failure of this particular to secure itself as particular. Right. So that, mm. I think that, I think that's, I think it's oftentimes we think in turn, like we think that just because there are two opposed positions that they're in a binary opposition, but I don't think it's a binary. I don't think it's, you have left and, leftism on one side and and i i actually feel i'm i'm a little like did i choose the right terms right and left like I, the old i tell you the reason why i chose them was because of the completely contingent way in which they emerged like they were just where mm -hmm. people were sitting in the parliament or whatever in the national convention whatever it was in, in 1789 so i i like that it's just contingent and there's no but maybe like it does there's a way in which it it makes people think of some kind of inter eternal opposition between two sides. And I think that's the wrong way to think of it. I think that the whole point of the leftist side is we don't need this opposition, right? Mm. Like that's the whole, to me, that's the whole point that if you're, if you're, if you imagine yourself as a leftist and think, oh, I need to struggle against, I'm going to own the no, but this isn't a thing, right? Like I'm yeah. going to own the conservatives. <laughs> like the other thing is a thing. Like I'm going to own the libs. And I think we could talk about the difference between liberalism and leftism. But uh, if you think I'm going to own the conservatives, you've already left to me the terrain of leftist politics because you've abandoned that universality for the sake of a binary. So I think a binary is always a problem, even <laughs> though someone could say to me, well, wh what's the deal with the title of your thing? But the title, like in the, for the left, that right should be is should be erased. Like that's the point. You're trying to erase that and say, I, I think I give this example somewhere. I don't know, maybe not in this book, but I say, you know how, uh, not occupy, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement. They would constantly say to the police, "Come kneel with us. Like you are on our side, right?" Mm -hmm. Like I think yeah. that that's uh, that's the leftist gesture. Whereas the right wing gesture is like. Uh, Jews will not replace us. Or, and like you could never imagine in Charlottesville, people saying, Jews, come on, join the crew. Like that would be, right. be absurd, right? Yeah. So I think that's, so that's why to me, it's not a binary. And yet I would say these are the only two possible positions because I think other things that we think, well, that's neither left nor right. I think you could, 
you could say, well, the form of enjoyment it's offering people is one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that makes a ton of sense. Um, it's more, it's in more like aligned with like the not two of Lacan. Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Tyler, are you going to say something? Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you yeah, off. No, I was just going to say the, 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 the sentiment of wanting to stick it to the conservatives. I feel like it is a thing. I mean, it's, it's such a popular, like liberal, uh, sentiment. Um, but, and then, and then I was also just to take your analogy of the kneeling, the uh, proper leftist movement asking the police or any other se seeming opposition to kneel with them. I suppose a, a right wing uh, sort of case would be uh, asking the Jews to kneel before you, right? Or while, while whilst you're standing. While you're standing, form. right? Yeah, that's a really that's really nice. I think that's right. Like that would be a right wing position. Like to say the other you kneel, I'm going to stand, right? right? Like that would, yeah, totally. Okay. Very good. But but yeah, so so I think it's again an important yeah, important thing to to emphasize that it's not a binary, right? Uh, another right. thing you touched uh, on, absolutely. on the previous absolutely. question. It's not a conflict between left and right wing uh enjoyment, even though it might ostensibly seem that way in the media and all these other other and even in the title of my book, for God's sake. Right? It's like difficult I, to, I even, so, yeah. yeah, there's a risk of that, right? And I yeah. think that's a that's I don't know how to avoid that though. I think with psychoanalysis it's difficult to articulate a lot of its points without sounding like uh, without sounding reactionary or, or often, I mean, I know Lacan is, is often, uh, is often vilified for, for sticking, seemingly sticking with binaries, even though he's right. using them right. to right. deconstruct them. Right. Absolutely true. And I also think like Tyler's a dialectical analyst or therapist, like that, like the whole point of dialectics is that, it, it seems like you're creating a binary, but you're really exposing a contradiction, right. right? So I think that, to me, there always is this difficulty of language, right? Like Hegel differentiates between what he calls an ordinary proposition and a speculative proposition, but there's no difference in how it sounds. It's the, it's the exact same thing, except we have to read it speculatively mm -hmm. rather than in an ordinary way, but we need the ordinary way in order to arrive at the speculative. So that's why I think it's a it's a dicey business. This trying this attempt to like oh how can we how do we speak the how do we talk about what's going on this contradiction without falling into what seems like an apparently binary logic. Right, yeah. makes sense. Uh, but so we and we had some. So I guess I suppose your answer is. You don't want to identify as a binary, but but you 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 do see as the the two types of political enjoyment there there being uh, right wing and left wing. But we had that's some it. perhaps. Yeah, that's it for uh, me. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have one. Where? We so, so yeah, Nick. Oh um no, I, I didn't mean to cut off your flow. Sorry. No, that's okay. I was just going to suggest uh, other forms of, of or other behaviors that we would perhaps want Todd to to look at for us. Yeah, like um. Yeah, I think one of the things that I was struck by, you know, in the example of, you know, the police coming to kneel with the Black Lives Matter protesters um, is the potential for, you know, maybe a different form of enjoyment within that of, you know, the enjoyment of the police officer who kneels with the protester and then goes back to shoot them with a tear gas canister 10 minutes later or Nancy Pelosi kneeling in solidarity with Black Lives Matter only to then, you know, fully fund the structures of war and oppression that, you know, are killing black people in America and then all over the world. Is there, a, you know, a difference between liberal enjoyment and leftist enjoyment in their relationship to non-belonging? Right. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. Absolutely true. And I think that, I think that those, I think you've, especially the Pelosi example, right? Like she's the, I, I have a graduate student who uh, worked on Wall Street and he said, Pelosi is the most adept at making enacting laws and then have getting a benefit for her investments and investing on the basis of her inside knowledge, of course. making perfect investments. So absolutely, I think absolutely like that, like that to me is the perfect liberal position. So I think that absolutely what I meant is the break between liberalism and leftism. Like I think liberalism, even though it prides itself because it prides itself on inclusivity is actually on the side of right-wing enjoyment. So I don't think, I absolutely think that for instance, this, the liberal cop that kneels and then uses tear gas, if we're assuming it's a liberal, not a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. Then that, that's, they're just on the side of conservative. They've just mm -hmm. manipulated 
that leftist form for a minute and then gone out of it. Same thing with Pelosi. I mean, if it was ever sincere, the kneeling, let's assume it was, it was still done uh, uh, just to, just to, I think this gesture of inclusion, the problem with it is it always relies on a secret exclusion. And I think we mm. really, in one sense, I think we owe Hillary Clinton a great debt for this basket of deplorables comment, right? Like it really showed the way that, wait a minute, I want to be totally inclusive, but the only way I can do it is if there's a basket of deplorables out there that we can despise. I say we should look, somewhat be thankful because I, on the other hand, I think basket of deplorables would be a nice name for leftists. Like I think sure, yeah. it shouldn't be that that uh, that right wingers go around with shirts that say I'm one of the basket of deplorables. I mean, that should be a left wing thing that pe that people wear. So I, I really... I would like a shirt like that. And I wish that she hadn't used that in the way that she did, because now I can't wear a shirt like that no. because it would clearly identify me with like uh, God only knows who. So I think that that's a, I think, but what it revealed was so interesting that any kind of inclusion, this total inclusion always, is, it's not total. It always has this external figure. So that's what I would say about this liberal leftist distinction and these examples where it seems like we're getting the leftist gesture, but this kind of it's done with like your fingers crossed behind your back, right? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I guess I suppose I agree with that with that answer in general. But do you think that that sort of uh, like a, a faux non belonging or, or maybe a cynical non belonging deserves its own category? Like it seems as though I mean, even if we look at a, a phenomena such as like advertising and marketing, it seems as as though it, it's it's now conventional for uh for for companies and their pr programs or pr strategies to uh embody this position of non-belonging like uh you know like uh, uh pro uh, pride campaigns or or yeah uh, like the the raytheon pride campaign yeah exactly right right but but is it possible for there to be a capitalist non-belonging i i don't I don't think mm. there is like, I, I mean, that's what I would yeah. say. Like, I don't think like, okay, I get that they're using these figures of, but it's always an, it's always an attempt to say like purchase our commodity, then you can feel like you belong and then you won't be part of the masses that don't belong. Right. Like that's the, to me, that's the essence of the appeal that every capitalist makes, right? Like it's always about this, the commodity can allow you to belong in a way that not having the commodity won't allow you to belong. And I think the more it, it's becoming more and more evident that that's true, interestingly, right? Like it's not about just buying the right commodity. It's about becoming the your proper self, like your proper own brand, right? So like it's having a certain thing so that you appear like you belong in a way that other people don't, right? So it's not even like getting the thing to enjoy. It's like getting the thing to have a certain image of belonging attached to it. So I, I think that that's what I would say to that. Like, I don't think there's a capitalist non-belonging. I mean, I, I think, but I do think, I like your point about another category. Like, I think that's really good that this, this idea of, I mean, I think that there's an interesting overlap, almost complete between capitalism and liberal inclusivity, right? Like they mm -hmm. both, they both pretend to want to bring everyone in and then require certain people being out in order for them to function. Both do that, right? So I think that's pretty interesting, but I think that, I think you're right. Like there is this third category of inclusion that I do talk about a little bit in the book, but I think, I, I do think maybe it should have its own separate. So it should be enjoyment right, left and middle or something, right? Like, I think that there is a, there is something to that that's not exactly like, and I think I maybe molded it too much to the conservative position and, and in a way because i see that necessary exclusion to it but i think maybe you're right that maybe it's a, its own third third position yeah it, it seems to and and just the type of belonging that that uh i suppose we call it consumerist uh enjoyment fosters or or maybe vice versa the, the kind of uh the kind of enjoyment that 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 consumerist belonging fosters it seems to be kind of different from any other sort of belonging in the sense that there's no 
I suppose certain commodities come with them. There's certain their ideologies, and and like if you were to buy these sneakers, you would be you know uh, the, the coolest sneaker guy in your high school. But it just seems a lot more fragmented that sense of belonging. There's no whereas right. conservative belonging, you know, it's political or ostensibly political because action and praxis can be developed from it, bringing people together under a common cause to a certain extent. But right. consumerist. Uh, the belonging of the of the consumer seems to be so fragmented and almost like on a different, you know. I don't totally know. agree. Totally agree. Yeah. I just, I mean, this book, I think it tells. I think there's like one or two little things on capitalism, one or two chapters, and I, I've just written so much about that that I, I tried to, but you know, it's a book on politics, so maybe that needed to be get its own thing there. I mean, more than it did. So yeah, I take that point really. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think to be fair to you as well, like, I think that the, you know, sort of centrist or, you know, liberal, cynical position still falls on the right. Mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, it can't sustain contradiction. It can't sustain, um, you know, it has to fall back on particularity and exclusion in the, you know, the material analysis and in, in the last, in the last, you know moment it can't yeah i like that that's my favorite thing for marx like in the last instance and i mm -hmm. think you're right like in the last instance it does it had like that's what i was getting at that in the in the end in the last instance there's no that it, when the rubber hits the road there's no difference between the conservative position and the liberal position because they both rely on this necessary exclusion absolutely yeah i think i think uh the the nature of your book the, the brevity of it uh and with with that the clarity of it uh, a lot of these questions arise from that from that brevity because it is it, it is clear and it is brevity, uh, brief, but there's just so many um, us having read so many of, of your books and knowing how you think and knowing that you you definitely have more complex and and uh, and dynamic ideas about this. This is pretty yeah, much no, what the question right. was. That he's out, you know? Yeah, this book was meant to be a much more like wider, mm -hmm. uh, like not so theoretically. Like I don't even know. Is Lacan quoted once? I don't even know. Maybe not. Like maybe in a footnote or something, mm -hmm. but I don't, I'm not. And Hegel, maybe there's a little, but there's not a exactly. lot. So, yeah. so yeah, I was meant this to be much more of a popular, there's more jokes and things, you know, and I think there's stuff about, doesn't it end with the movie Heathers? I, I hope that I kept that yeah. in there. As, yes. Yeah. 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 So, so it's much more, uh, it's much more meant to be a, like a, a popular book than. No, like, for sure. I, I, think, I definitely think it succeeded in that. Yeah. yeah. It reminds me a lot of um, Capitalist Realism by Mark Fisher. By Mark Fisher. But yeah. Very. I like, take that as a great compliment. I love that book. And I, I love using that book in a classroom, too, because it's so it's so concise and it's it's you know, you can teach it in a week and it's it's great. It's true. And it's so compelling. It's just uh, yeah, you, so can compelling. Almost, you can almost feel the book. You yeah. Know. Um, but yeah, I. Uh, I don't know if we want to continue on because we were also going to ask about like ostensibly non-political behaviors or or forms of enjoyment like addiction, gambling, habitual scrolling, hoarding, uh, like uh, overconsumption. You know how what what using this framework? How would you I guess interpret those behaviors, which seem to be in contemporary society all the more uh, widespread and pervasive? Yeah, yeah, that's that's. I don't know that I would, I mean, clearly they're not enjoyment of non-belonging, right? Like, except in the last, except insofar as all enjoyment is the enjoyment of non-belonging, right? But, but there, I think what's interesting about those versus explicitly political enjoyment is that they don't, they're, they're clearly unconscious. And I mean, the, not mm -hmm. the enjoyment is unconscious, but the, the mechanism that generates the enjoyment is unconscious. Like you don't, no one consciously says like oh, how can i get myself addicted to drugs right now I, I don't i've never i mean maybe there's a one person but or like how can i conscious how can i find myself scrolling i just want to spend the whole day scrolling through the internet like no one gets up in the morning and says that to themselves yeah, unless you're think. like really depressed yeah it would be pretty bad right so and then i mean all those things and like what was the other example like overeating or yeah, overconsumption, hoarding. Overconsumption. Yeah, no one says to themselves like, "Oh, I want to." How many things can I buy today? They mm -hmm. just get up, they get in this, they get stuck in a thing, and then they keep doing it, right? So I think that, whereas I think the people that went to Charlottesville, they're like, "Hey, I want to go to Charlottesville and join this right wing white supremacy night," right? Like I think it's a pretty, it's that's a pretty big difference. That I think the 
And okay, you can say, well, there's unconscious reasons why they're why they're drawn to that. And of course, right? That's true for all of us about our political position. But I think that's a, I just think that explicit conscious versus unconscious distinction is pretty important in this. That's why I wouldn't, I mean, those aren't necessarily political, those forms of enjoyment, in, except insofar as all enjoyment is political. Like there's not, there's no way to strip that away from it. Mm -hmm. I would just say this, that I think that they, that, that you are striving for, and this is why I think it, those are linked. I and mean, it's important that overconsumption is one of your examples, because I think what you are striving for is a sense of completion, belong, whatever you want to call it, belonging, uh, for like ultimate satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And drugs are the, one of the more interesting ones, right? Because oftentimes your first experience of the drug is really, it's great elation. I wouldn't call it, I, I don't think you've once experienced some kind of complete enjoyment and then it's lost. I know a couple of people that did heroin and they think that first time it's amazing. And then you're trying to get back to it. But I think that that logic is there, there in each in all of those things, right? Like the smoking is kind of interesting because I, I think the first time is rather unpleasant, but I think it, you know, it, you come, you're still searching for something. It's never quite, there's something. And I think this is the source of addiction, all kinds of addiction, all these things that, okay, some people are going to say, no, there's physiological. And of course there are right there, but, but I just mean the psychic mechanism of addiction. Like I think you're, what's driving you unconsciously is some some enjoyment that you feel like is present there but you can't quite get and i think that's what's that so yeah. i think that is in that way it's tied to this idea of belonging and right-wing enjoyment all these things like mm -hmm. all these things are so about how can i find this point at which i everything is going to finally be okay i one last thing like freud he ends studies on hysteria with this penultimate sentence, but he says, uh, the point of analysis is tr uh, transforming, it's not curing people, it's transforming hysterical misery into common unhappiness, right? And so I think that to me is left-wing enjoyment, common unhappiness, mm -hmm. and right-wing enjoyment is the search for happiness, right? Basically, like like the whole American ideal of the you know, life literary pursuit of happiness is really saying like, how can we, entrench people in a right-wing form of enjoyment because if you're seeking happiness you're you're on the path to that's you're seeking that right-wing enjoyment yeah. i think yeah. it it seems like right-wing enjoyment is everywhere around us you know very pervasive i think you know that's what's such a big focus of the book is because there's just so much of it um but it, you know it causes me to ask the question like you know, why is it so difficult to sustain a project of leftist enjoyment? You know, why why is the left systemically out of power, you know, especially in America? But, you know, it seems like all over the world. Um, yeah, except South, right? Work? Like they the South, they seem to have it more on the ball than we do. Right. Like I'm thinking of like incredible in Colombia. Right. Like this elect yeah. like right wing rule for so long. And then I mean, and Bolivia, Morales regime, pretty good, really, I think. And they were in power for until a coup but then they got back in power <laughs> so lula I, lula right i mean mm -hmm. which is also in jeopardy which shows that i think the power of this i mean even those cases where we get this like chile we get these great examples of leftism in power there's still there's a real threat to them like from from coup from military uh, uh military dictatorship so i think that i think that the there's something, and Nick, I think this is the tenor of your question. There's something really appealing about that right wing form of enjoyment. And I think what it, here's what I think it is. I think that it, it allows us to imagine the enjoyment happening in the other and not, we don't have to, it doesn't, it allows us not to take responsibility for our own enjoyment. Right. And I think that's the, that's the real appeal of it. And I mm -hmm. think the horror of the left is that you have to take responsibility for your own enjoyment, even if you're imagining it in someone else. Because I don't think anyone, it's not like, oh, you can have enjoyment directly, right? Like even when, let's just use a sexual example, right? Like you're, even when you're having sex, you're still imagining, you have a fantasy that says like, okay, someone's watching us do it. And I imagine the person watching, or I imagine what the other person is feeling, whatever. But the point, the point is not to get rid of that for as a leftist form. The point is to say, Look, I'm responsible for that. That's my, 
That's not actually them. That's my enjoyment. That that's the form that my enjoyment takes. And I think that's a really that's the I think that's the difficulty of the step, really. And I think that's why it's so easy for uh, leftist regimes to turn back to the right, like because they they want to find an enemy. I think I talk about about Robespierre in here because for me that's a really in Haiti because I think those examples are pretty revelatory but also damning of the leftist project because there's the way in which there's this internal difficulty of sustaining this lack of an enemy because it's so much it's such a relief to feel like the enemy is out there and they're the cause of the of the of the why why am I not really fully enjoying myself it's the enemy you know I think I I mean I even fall into that all the time right like I'm like oh I would just have such a great situation if this person wasn't here and then, but that's, you're already, if you're thinking that, then you're already lost. Yeah. So, yeah. So I guess in relation to this question, built into symbolic order or into subjectivity, is there this, what is the, what is our drive towards uh, this belonging? You know, uh, if you could maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Place I it think somewhere. It, if I can take up the term that you used in the opposite sense, like drive, like I think it's a way it's going to be more of a theoretical answer, but I think it's the way our drive is traumatic for us. Like our drive, which is why it's not conscious, right? Like our drive is we find enjoyment in failure, loss, non-belonging, but that is traumatic for us. And so we want to find somewhere to, to put the blame for that. So, that, and, and also we want to imagine a way out of that. Like we want to imagine some kind of future. Like that's to me, the entire appeal of the commodity. Like I get the proper commodity. I'm, Oh, I'm out of my situation of lack and I'm fulfilled, right? Like every, I've never seen an ad that doesn't in some way work on that logic. You know, like there, I don't, maybe there will be one someday, but I've never seen one. So I feel like that's the, that's the real that's 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 so it's it's actually our refusal or our inability maybe to accept our own drive that turns us that keeps us seeking that right and then, and i suppose the next question is is like is there something about our current conditions social conditions that make the avowal uh difficult or 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 encourage us to disavow that that. Yeah, I think so. I think it's I think as capitalism develops, I think it becomes harder and harder because you know, you're a, like imagine you're a subject in I don't know, let's say in the United States, like uh 1930s US, right? Like it's not like capitalism is in a kind is in a crisis. And I think it's not so hard to think of yourself as wow, I'm a subject of lack. I'm a a tie to all these other subjects of lack and there's no commodity in the world. I just hope I can get enough to eat. There's no commodity in the world that's going to bring me any kind of salvation. So I feel like our particular situation, it does make it harder. And I think this, there's so many things going on. Like I think social media really is a, is part of the way it's become, I know this is kind of in a sense on social media and I'm, I, I don't know, podcast is kind of on social media, but I mean, Instagram, Facebook, all these things that are really constantly, I think that the, they hold out this idea of recognition so powerfully that it becomes impossible not to think in terms of recognition. I just know I'm a sports fan. And so I, I notice how often everything is talked about in terms of money in a way that when I was a kid, it never was. And so, okay. So part of it is the players are more empowered and that's all to the good, right? But mm. The other part of it is all we can think about is in terms of which money is just a signifier for recognition, right? Like it's like, if I don't get paid enough, it means I'm not recognized as having sure. the proper status, right? So I feel like that, that like it seems like because of social media, because of like, it's almost impossible to get out of this frame of recognition. And I think that's the recognition is belonging. And so I feel like that's the real, that's the real problem. Like, I think that that's why it's so difficult today. And so it seems so almost impossible to imagine any, uh, any way out of that, really.
Yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to be getting into social media a little bit, a little bit later, but okay. we, we are definitely in agreement that, that that is one of the, the leading, the leading uh, causes of our, or uh, yeah, of, of our, of our inability or, or la- lack of capacity to, to, to start a leftist project. But yeah, yeah. I think that's one thing that, that Baudrillard really touched on very well of we're living in the world of the hyper reality. Um, yeah, Nick, it's a really good point. You know, I, I, I made the mistake of calling Baudrillard a, a philosophical pipsqueak. We were just last, talking about that. We were on like, my last man. podcast and, and a <laughs> friend of mine, this guy, Michael Downs, he's almost he's like, I can't believe it. You've totally betrayed me. <laughs> and so I, uh, I, I want to officially apologize for that. Um, I, I, because I did, I, it was, it was like, a, it was totally a cheap shot. And I agree with you. I think Baudrillard is pretty good on this question. I think as a, and I actually think some of his uh, anal- early uh, analysis of Marx is pretty good. Uh, I, I, I guess I don't find him as why well, I said that philosophically was as a reader of like German idealism. It's I don't find him as weighty as some other figures. But I I I I wasn't trying to say that in a way that indicated I don't think he has insights because I think you're right. Like I think his insight ab- about the hyper real I think is really it's pretty good, and I think he in a way anticipates our the situation of social media that. It, it, as other thinker, no other thinker maybe did. Mm. Yeah, it's it's one of it's one of Nick and I's longstanding projects to uh, to somehow combine Baudrillard and Lacan. No, it's interesting how other people have that project too. So yeah. that's uh, yeah, good. Um, but yeah, I, we have another specific specific question about about leftist enjoyment and the it's it's sort of fleetingness. Uh, at least in, in contemporary society, um, but yeah. So, what would you say the the, the George Floyd protests in twenty two twenty twenty tell us about leftist enjoyment? Uh, again, this sort of transitoriness or this this like um, very temporary black Ma- Black Lives Matter movement and a lot of other movements. Why are they so easily we 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 like the word scuttled? Uh, scuttled. Yeah, in the terms of Nick, what was the definition? Sinking your own ship. Yeah, or, you know, easily, I bet the left is easily, you know, scattered. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we can we can generate a tremendous amount of energy and power with non-belonging, you know, the I can't breathe, you know, the, this moment that, you know, you know, this you know, particular situation became universal and swept the nation. And then, you know, it just dissipates it, you know. In the same way that like May 68, it seems like has right. dissipated. Yeah. And right. while the, right. the. Or Walsh Occupy, right? Like that, yeah, another... that too. Yeah. That's probably the best example. But and, and while the right wing enjoyment provides a sort of like an out, like, and it's, it's appeal. Uh, it does seem that there's something inherent to left wing enjoyment. You even say in, in the book that, that the, the contradiction inherent to left wing enjoyment, or it manifests as a sort of transitory. Uh, nature you know yeah i i think that's absolutely right i mean i think i would just say two things about this i'd say one yeah yeah that uh, that's the problem and i think it's related to the form that the enjoyment takes right like that if it's an enjoyment of non-belonging it's hard to hold it together right because there's nothing to hold it together it's much easier for conservatives to hold it together if you think like the entire other side is a bunch of baby killers right like it's pretty easy to say like our movement's going to stay strong because we're fighting against the baby killers. What would you do? I mean, of course you'd stay together. Yeah. Of course you'd say like, look at who, like think about the way in which, I mean, the the times in which the left is able to hold it together are that like, think about like the popular front. Like they did a, that was a pretty good job of fighting off Nazism, right? Like that was a, that was, but it's only when there's this, it has to kind of borrow from the right to co to make the group coalesce, right? So I think that there's something to that, that 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 that's the inherent weakness of I mean, rightist enjoyment is always parasitical, but leftist enjoyment is always fragmented and and hard to hold together just because it doesn't, there's no belonging attached to it. But the other thing I would say is our particular within this comes back to what we were talking about earlier about liberalism, like the 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 completely anti-collectivist way that we conceive of our own subjectivity as just I'm isolated monad, no connection to anyone else. Like that 
that idea seems to me to be also a real barrier to that, any movement like that holding on because you just retreat back into your privacy and the public is, huh, I, you know, I care about it, but I'm not going to go out and really do anything because I'm just this isolated monad. So I think that's a real, I think that's a real part of it too. But I think it's in the nature of it that it's not, it's going to be hard to sustain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? I, I, I have probably one comment. No, yeah, yeah. You go for it. Yeah. I'm just curious uh, on this, on the topic of like leftist uh, political projects or just left-wing enjoyment in general. Uh, I don't, I don't know how you'd respond to this, but I got a very, not a very, but a, a subtly Deleuzian vibe from the way you were describing leftist political action uh, and the way you just, you describe that, like in order to occupy the position of non-belonging, you have to sort of like demolish your own symb uh, symbolic identity uh, and everything is again fragmented as you say but everything is sort of uh in in flux you know i don't, I don't know how you'd respond Did i say flux no not flux. flux no no yeah but i i suppose that's how i describe it it just seems like this uprooting is is what happens uprooting no, no, from ah, the ah, that's a really good word i think uprooting is exactly the word mm -hmm. but i i guess for me and this would be my way my position which i draw a line in the sand contra Deleuze, right that i think that uprooting is different from nomadic right like i think it's not a nomadic which i associate with deleuze not a nomadic position <clears throat> sorry but rather one that's constantly uprooting itself so not so it's not that it's it's like fl flowing everywhere it's that it's constantly finding itself out of joint displaced and so i think and i, I think the point would be yeah, and I think this is what I have in common with Deleuze. Sorry, <laughs> I've been a little sick. Um, that that um, uh, I know how loud that sounds on a on a podcast. So it's a, actually it's Zoom a Zoom normalizes everything, so you can. Oh, does it really? Loud okay, so I want. have to do that on my on our <laughs> podcast. I got to do all this editing, crazy stuff. So, I mean, my my, I think the difference is that that that. Uh, for me, the lack of a symbolic identity or lack of identity co is correlated to subjectivity itself. Whereas I think Deleuze mm -hmm. wants to identify identity and subjectivity, if, yes. I, if that makes sense. Like, right. Like, so, so for me, non-belonging is subjectivity. Like that is the name of subjectivity. So that's not a mm -hmm. loss of subjectivity. It's a loss of identity. And I think those two things are radically different. And yes. I, but I think, Okay, I share the critique of identity. What I don't share is a critique of subjectivity, because I think it's subjectivity that we use as a <clears throat> as our alienated subjectivity is precisely our non-belonging. So if we lose that, then we actually lose touch with our non-belonging. So I think that's a that's the point which I would say there's that's a pretty good. crucial difference. Yeah. yeah, that clarifies it right up for me. Uh, that's, that's that's really nice. But so I, I would I would follow up with uh, do you, is there a correlation between the effect efficacy of a movement um and how rooted you are like like for organization and to, to like get something done uh how does the leftist form of enjoyment and, and this constant uprooting like how would you envision like i guess practically uh, this 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 mode of constantly uprooting uh organizing and and getting something done you know well i would just say this i don't think that um I don't think uprooting means you're constantly undermining yourself, right? Like mm -hmm. uprooting just means you're not tied to a certain, like you're not getting your energy from a particular identity, right? Like, I think yeah. that's it. And I think, so I'm not, I, it doesn't seem to me like that's necessarily means you're, you can't, you can't have a, a stable position that you're arguing. It's just that it's not rooted in a particular identity, right? Like, it's not like, Oh, wait, we're all whatever, we're all white guys. So that's our, pro where our project is going to be about white advancing the cause of whiteness, or we're all, uh, I don't know, whatever, we're all uh, French. So it's going to be about advancing the cause of the French, right? Like it's, instead it's, instead it's, okay, it's egalitarian, right? It's, it's, how do we, how do we best create a form of equality for everyone, right? So mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's that that to me 
if the project is one of equality, if the project is one of solidarity, if the project is one of freedom, then it's uprooted, right? Like it's not because those values are only exist insofar as they're you're they're tied to our uprootedness. Like there's right. no there's no rooted equality because in our in our place in our rootedness we're absolutely hierarchical, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that so so like there's a natural hierarchy. But it's only in our unnatural uprootedness that there isn't a hierarchy. Right. So I think that's a that's what I would say about that. I understand. Yeah, it's that recurring that recurring um, dialectical like opposition that, that keeps coming up. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it applies to equality as well. It can't be. Yeah. There is no such thing as a as a. An, a there's no rooted, rooted equality, right? Yeah, there's no rooted equality. Like, think about it. Like, like you're probably taller than me. I'm like fitter than I'm not saying I'm really <laughs> fitter, but I'm just giving example, right? Like I'm Probably. fitter. So there's all kinds of natural inequalities, right? But 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 in our uprootedness, in our political being, there can that's where equality comes in, right? Which can sometimes attempt to, and I think must try to counteract natural inequalities, right? Like the, it's interesting, you know. Like I was just thinking about this. Like the do you know this guy? Do you remember him? He was uh, Clinton's Treasury Secretary, and he became president of Harvard. His name is Lawrence Summers. You remember this guy? His first name's Trump. Lord. Lawrence. Lawrence. Oh, Lawrence, Lawrence Summers. Hopefully, you don't know him because no. he—it's good know. that his name is lost to history, and you guys are the future. So, uh, anyway, he was when he's president of Harvard. He got in trouble. He had to end up resigning, but not for this. Ironically, he said there are less women in math and engineering because they're naturally less gifted for that it just makes sense right and so incredible liberal obviously critique of him like no there we're all equal that's not true mm -hmm. and i just said well okay so let's say it is true I mean, let's say there is a natural so why wouldn't the project of harvard be let's gonna correct let's try to correct this natural inequality by like putting more women into <laughs> or it could even be the opposite it could be it could be well, because we're all un have an unconscious, if you have a natural deficit in something, you're more driven to work in that area sure. than someone who's naturally good. Like I, I didn't read till I was well into first grade. Like I was a terrible reader, and I but I was well. I did well in math. I found math utterly boring, and I was totally devoted to reading. Right. So so right. My, it wasn't because I had a natural gift. It was because I didn't have a natural gift. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the, that inequality is written into the natural thing, but, but equality is written into the overcoming of that, like the, the way in which the uprooted part of it. So that's why, that's what I would say. Like, I don't think it means, oh, we got to constantly like undo our political thing because we're, we're on the side of uprootedness. Let's just, let's throw, you know, like we, jump all around every five minutes or something. I'm, I'm not, I'm yeah. not trying to mock your position, but I, I you think, know what I'm saying? Yeah, go ahead. And one thing you touch on too, is that our subjectivity isn't rooted in nature, that it's, you know, what takes us beyond nature that alienates us from nature right. or, right. you know, availability to overcome. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. Nick, that's absolutely right. Right. Like, like subjectivity is precisely your, your denaturedness, right. The way that you are, you don't, you're not identical. And that's why I think all the neo-Darwinist explanations for why we're doing certain things. I always think, wait a minute, it could explain the exact, the exact, the opposite way. And what's ironic is it often does like, you know, like Steven Pinker explains, you know, this is right. Steven Pinker. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he explains male infidelity by saying, you know, there's this whole, like, in order to your genetic material to reproduce itself, men want to have, and, and, Women, on the other hand, are 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 faithful because they need someone to help ma maintain them. And okay, but you could easily imagine that explanation working just the other way. Like women want to find the best possible, I don't know, genetic material to reproduce, so they're going to go around and have sex with. Something. Like you could you could work it the other way. It doesn't. I, I that's what I always find with these explanations. Like they're so rooted in. And my friend Maury Rudy has a great book on this. I think it's called Scientific Sexism. Mm -hmm. And it's about the way in which evolutionary biology is used to, evolutionary psychology, I should say, is used to justify certain sexist assumptions. And I I, I just think, yeah, like our subjectivity is precisely this denaturedness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and I would say also that nature is this utterly contingent phenomena. 
Yeah, absolutely, Nick. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And so it's right. difficult right. to build. Like that's a good, I like that way of thinking of nature. And I think what's interesting is I think that's the main <laughs> um, Darwinist contribution, right? That the, like, instead of there's a design to the natural mm. world, there's a, a radical contingency to the natural world. But so often neo-Darwinists want to, they, they want to reinstitute a certain kind of necessity in through the idea of ad adaptation. So I think that's yeah. interesting, but I, I like, I really like that idea of natural equals contingent. I think it's pretty good. Mm. Yeah. I think that that helps us really segue well into the next question, um, you know, on the relationship between race and fantasy, you know, talking about the contingency of nature. I mean, skin color is one of those. Right. Right. Absolute right. contingencies. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you wrote a, you know, a fantastic book uh, that I admittedly haven't finished, The Racist Fantasy, all on this topic. And I just would love to hear more of your thoughts on that connection between race and fantasy. Absolutely. Right. So I think that um, your point is really good that that without fantasy, there wouldn't even be any race at all. Right. Like that, that it takes a phantasmatic gesture to make race count for obviously there is there are different natural distance differences in skin color but to make that count for something that requires this phantasmatic act so i think that's that's number one but the other the idea that drove me to write the book was the role that uh the 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 racial the i miss the term i use and i i use it advisedly the the role that the racial other plays for the racist subject in constituting their enjoyment and they need this other as a barrier to their to the enjoy like the, there there is this perfect enjoyment out there and then i just can't quite get it because there's this racial other in the example i would advise everyone by the way as long as you don't have certain tendencies in this direction to read mind comp because hiller is a pretty great on someone could really take that out of context it's pretty <laughs> great on on the racist fan on like the way in which that racist fantasy is structured because his his he thinks that there's this figure of the Jew who's barring the enjoyment of the, the he calls it, what does he say? Like the pure German woman or the pure German girl, something mm -hmm. um, uh, for German, like the hardworking German men, right? Like they're like the figure of the Jew for Hitler is absolutely this barrier that you run into. So I think that's to me, that's what started that that book. And I just thought that was one where I thought, well, this seems <laughs> Just almost, I shouldn't say it's like it seemed obvious to me, and no one had said it, and so I thought maybe I should, someone should say it, and so I, I thought I should say it. But that, but it seemed like if you think about racism in terms of psychoanalysis, this just it kind of it's it seems almost commonsensical to me. Yeah. But I don't I don't think it's commonsensical in the wider world, obviously. Because I think people th do what you didn't do, Nick. I think they think that race is just something that exists, and then it, and then we have to overcome racism, which exists just because the race exists, right? Like my 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 mother, who was a, she gave me a good. She was a very she had. I think I have an acknowledgement about her in the book. Is that's pretty talks a little bit about this about how she was born in a terribly racist family. Her in laws are terribly racist, and she yeah. suffered for standing up for against racism. So. That all was on one side, but her, she used to constantly, she still, she has Alzheimer's, but she remembers to say this. She says, you know, I think we could end racism if people just intermarried, you know, totally. Because then we, there wouldn't be any more difference in skin color. And I'm always like, yeah, great idea. But of course, that's a terrible idea. Because Same logic. Same logic. It's this, right. Because it's like, you imagine that there's, that, that race is something that exists and that's why there's racism. It's, it's you know, clear I, that she's I, never I, been to Brazil. <laughs> that's a great nick it's a great it's, a great, it's true it a she point. hasn't been to brazil <laughs> although she had a brazilian exchange student but i don't think that is the same as going to brazil it's not enough so, it's not enough no it's not enough <laughs> but but yeah i i i that, i think i've also read i probably almost as much as as nick has of your book um and we we definitely it seems to be uh like the form of it it's it's or the the purpose you you saw for it was a little bit different from your um your enjoyment book yeah it's a little bit more in depth a little bit yeah. more yeah, yeah yeah like i i really one of the things i wanted to do was really and i think a lot of um 
to the extent that there are that many psychoanalytic treatments of racism don't really go into like all the stuff that's been written on racism by other thinkers. And so I really wanted to kind of address that in a full way. And then, yeah. and then also deal with certain kinds of historical subject matter that hasn't been that, you know, where we don't necessarily think that's racist or we're not, it's not clear that that's that link between that kind of racism and, you know, mm -hmm. everyday racism. So that's one of the things I wanted to do too there. So yeah, that, those were, so yeah, I think there's a lot more depth, breadth in that book than in mm -hmm. the, in the enjoyment book for sure. I think one thing that really impressed me about it, it was, you know, a unifying theory of racism to me that included material sort of structural systemic racism all the way to intersubjective racism within a cohesive psychic framework. Yeah, Nick, that's what I was trying to do because right, like I think it's pretty easy to say, well, and I think this is not untrue, that capitalist modernity generates racism, right? And then so you could, and then there's a not there's a kind of easy Marxist explanation for racism under its material conditions. Okay. That's I think that's true. But there's also, as you say, like just inner superior intersubjective racism, and that still has to be explained as well because you know, you can't just say, oh, it's all reducible to this guy. Well, then why are there differences? And why why are there some people who we can say are openly anti-racist and other people that are openly racist and they both live within the same capitalist matrix? Mm -hmm. So I think that, so yeah, thanks for saying that. That's exactly what I was trying to do. So that's, <laughs> at least one person saw it. Yes, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, next question. Yeah, yeah go for it. Oh, all right. Uh, well, actually, no, this is your question. I'm going to let you go for it. Okay. Um, so a question that we had um, was, what role does the superego play in political enjoyment? And does the superego manifest differently in left and right-wing enjoyment? Yeah, you had wow. talked about superego in left-wing enjoyment in its sort of uh, attack on itself. You even some you mentioned perversion in that somewhere in there as well, which I thought was interesting. But the superego seems to play a, an important role in, in left-wing uh, political projects or in a threat to political projects. Right. That's how I would put it, right? Like I would put it this way that, and I don't think I say this in the book. I mean, I, you're right. I do talk about superego a lot, but I think that superego is how left-wing projects die and it's the energy that feeds right-wing politics. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the difference I would say. And I think to me, Trump is the great figure of superego who's constant, you know, Lacan, I think one of Lacan's greatest things is that he ever said was when he said, the, "What is there's only one thing that commands enjoyment, and that is the superego. This is in Seminar 20. I think that's pretty great because Freud, for Freud, superego is just an agency of prohibition. And I think Lacan sees how, well, wait a minute, maybe this is actually, I mean, Freud, to be fair, Freud does say the superego gets its energy for, he reaches down to the id and gets its energy from the id. Okay, so there you could maybe locate that and say that's enjoyment, but Lacan is the first to really make this explicit. I think it's really pretty great. Maybe his greatest thing he ever said. He just said it offhandedly in Seminar 20. And I think that, uh, why does it betray? Oh, so first of right-wing enjoyment. Like I think Trump, what does he constantly he says? Like beat those guys up. Like what, you know, this constant imperative, like you don't have to be politically correct. Enjoy yourself. Like all this kind of thing. Uh, they stole the election, go out and do something about it. Like this unleashing people mm -hmm. to enjoy themselves. So I feel like there's a real super egoic dimension to him and to all right-wing enjoyment. Like it really, you you feel this super egoic compulsion to do something against the enemy that's the barrier to the enjoyment in the right-wing model. The left-wing model, it eats itself with super egoic, the super egoic term. Like you're con, and I think, it, man it manifests itself most directly today in this cancel culture. mania, right? Like, yeah, yeah. cancel cult. Yeah. Would you it's say it operates maybe more Freudian in in in, in the pro prohibition? Perhaps? Very nice, very yeah. nice, right? Yeah. Except the people endorsing it or employing it are getting their enjoyment yeah. from it, right? Like, yeah. But it does. I think it really, <clears throat> it really manifest. Like, you, you, there is a real sense. I mean, you guys are public figures, so you get this real sense where. Like if, if we said something not exact, I don't know if you feel so. Like, said something not exact, maybe I should edit that out so that there's not this brouhaha about. Sure. I mean, I, you know, I mentioned you this this Hamlin 
I don't know if it's university or college thing where mm-hmm. someone just showed a picture of a paint, a, fa- a, a, a Islamic painting of Muhammad, right? And then they got fired, which was a, it wasn't a caricature. It was, it was completely positive. And they got fired for offending uh, Islamic student in the class, even though the, the, there's a complete divide among Muslim thinkers about the, whether you should depict Muhammad or not, mm. right? Like, so that divide didn't get acknowledged at all. And it, in essence, the university, the college, whatever, was taking the side of the right wing in the debate about depicting Muhammad, right? Like, so there is a debate, right? And then someone in Minneapolis, I know, Nick, you're there. Someone, there was, I think the head of the anti-Muslim defamation league, whatever, said, uh, you know what? And someone brought up to him, like, there are different views on this issue in Islam. And he said, there are different views on every issue. There's some people that even think that Hitler did good things. And I, I, and then the, this person's like, oh, no, that's reductio ad absurdum. And I thought, no, the proper response would be, no, that's right. And you're on that side on this issue. That's what should have been said, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. there are people that think that. And that's what you're on that side. Like, and I find it interesting that this issue coincides with the incredible quiet around the conflict in Iran right now, right? Like, to me, this is the major political happening of our time. And it's like in the West, there's just complete silence because I think it causes people problems, but I think it's linked to this super egoic dimension of the way in which it destroys the left, right? Like I don't, I'm saying I, not my, I personally, but I, I don't want to speak out about Iran because it means fighting again. It means taking a stand against, you know, uh, Muslims in some yes. way. Right. And so I feel yeah. like in, in France, it's a huge issue, a huge problem because yeah. it's about the, like the, the right to wear the veil. And I don't, you know, and, and so I don't, and, and so th- they're burning veils in Iran. And so I don't want to be on the, do I want to be on the side of people burning them when yeah. that's people, the right wing doing it here. So I think it's, there's a, that, that really, there's a, this incredible kind of super egoic pressure that then defeats the leftist universality right like once you've succumbed to that then there's no universality because you're constantly thinking like wait a minute i'm gonna step in the wrong direction and i look i'm not saying this to say like don't be considerate about the views of whatever like of course right but the point is like people are gonna say wrong things they're gonna say wrong things even if they're trying to do the right thing and so Part of what they need to do is they can just say, look, I, I didn't mean to say the wrong thing. And then you just kind of go on. Like, that seems to me like this is a way in which the left is nicely Christian, right? Like, it's like, it's it's like, okay, you're just, you're forgiven your sins, right? Like you can, and I think that there's something to that. Like you you always allow the convert to come over, right? Like I was, when, when I was in high school, I was like a vehement Reagan supporter. I was on the camp. And like, but when I in college became a Marxist, no one said to me, wait a minute, used to be Reagan supporter. I don't think we can trust you in our little Marxist organization. They were like, no, no, come in. Of course you saw the light all the better, all the better, all the, yeah. better, all the better. Right. Like, like, and, and that's actually Christ says that, right? Like the further, the more sinful you were, the more your sins will be forgiven. Mm-hmm. So I think that I, I absolutely think that that, that turn to super ego is against that nicely leftist logic. Yeah. I, I, I would say you can find it. Oh, sorry, Tyler, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I was just going to say, I was just going to bring up Mark Fisher and his vampire castle, uh, if you're familiar with it. Todd. Yeah, yeah. 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 And and Twitter. And you already mentioned ca- cancel culture, but it it all cultivates this, this, uh, this environment of, of or a, a highly super egoic environment. Yeah, it's just super egoic, right? Like, mm-hmm. I think that that, I mean, it's interesting to think about uh, social media recognition to super ego, right? Like that, I think that would be, someone could write a whole book on that in relationships yeah. because I think that's pretty, pretty good. Yeah, but uh, go ahead, Nick, sorry. You know, I think that um, what I like about the way that you use super ego to touch on, you know, how leftist enjoyment eats itself is it functions for political projects as big as the USSR and China and for things as small as, you know, a 10 person Marxist group in a university or a a Twitter beef, like um, this need to purge oneself to, to sort of, you know, like purify the movement to, you know. Yeah, Nick, it's a good word, right? Like, I mean, it does, 
it's interesting how purge works for both Stalin and for the, the like true. the little 10 person group, right? Like it's like Stalin had a great purge, but we have nice little purges. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah. Um, next question, a new, a new scenario uh, or a new phenomena in at least uh, contemporary America. What does psychoanalysis have to tell us about the politics of mass shoot of the, uh, the yeah the politics of the mass shooting phenomenon and gun violence okay. in America in general? We figured that's, that's good. I, I it, it just shows that you can never predict what a question is going to say when it starts because I thought you were going to say QAnon. So I'm much I I I was like starting to think like what am I going to say? But I I like this much better. So I think the is I have one one thing to note about this. Isn't it interesting that forty. 30 years ago, it was the serial killer that yes. was that captured the public imagination. And now it's the mass shooter. I mean, it could just be technological that it's too hard to be a serial killer now because DNA and all this stuff, it makes it. But I don't know. That seems like a sad explanation. True crimes, true crime documentaries, so many of them. It's still a huge, a huge appeal to a lot of people, the serial killer. So there it is. So I so it's not this total shift. Okay. All right, fair enough. Uh but I think that the mass shooter is interesting. I mean, again, it's a lot of it is tied to this logic of recognition, right? Like I can, I can find, like, how can I gain recognition? I can engage in this, in this mass shoot. And I think there's almost a competition among mass shooters. I think that Vegas guy probably won for a long time, but like how many people I can kill when I do this, that will add to the recognition that I get. And I think it's an interesting, like, I think people, when they think about their recognition, like one thing that it shows is they don't consider whether they're alive or dead in terms of the recognition that it will bring them. Right. Like I think the, the enjoyment that we imagine associated with recognition, I think it's so divorced from subjectivity. It doesn't matter if you're alive or dead. That's why you can go out and go on a shooting spree thinking you might be killed and it doesn't matter because you're still going to be recognized for the shooting. So I think that's, I think the logic of recognition is really important, but I think what it nicely coincides with is I think the, the logic of the drive itself is self-destructive, but that's so hard to confront that I think we oftentimes destroy others as a way of destroying ourselves. So that's what I think is really happening in mass shooting, that it's a way, how can I destroy myself how how can I destroy myself in the guise of destroying others? Like yeah. that's what I think is happening. Yeah, so, I think... but I mean, obviously, I mean, the most obvious thing is the gun, the the, the like, the craziness that guns are available. I mean, because it's basically an American phenomenon, mm -hmm. right? Like it, like it happens occasionally. But but I would even wager that if it didn't happen so often in America, we wouldn't even have any of these incidents abroad, right? Like they're basically want to be americans like American the guy in norway culture. yeah 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 i don't New i don't Zealand, think there's yeah any, yeah the, like, like those church. are not right yeah. that christchurch it's not a that wasn't a new zealand act i mean sorry i'm not mean to take away their autonomy but that was a <laughs> that was a clear copycat of america thing and i think it's a and i think it's a real like why is that true like i think it's a real like i think it comes back to this isolated monad idea right like i'm i i I don't think about the larger collective. I just think about, and I think the people that own guns or hunting, I, I guess we'll leave it as an exception, uh, even though as vegetarian, I'm not so much in favor, but okay, I understand people do it. Uh, although I noticed that Prince Harry, someone told me this in his novel or whatever about him. I mean, it's not a novel, but whatever his little memoir and it talked about his love of hunting and so that made me like him even less but um <laughs> I, I i mean i don't mind like people that are hunting for their food and working but, but no mm -hmm. he's not he's not anyway sorry for the quite digression the uh he's quite the opposite right uh although someone told me he had to do all this stuff for recognition because he lost all his money when he gave up the royalty so hunting was his know. path back to recognition right, there we go there we go that's interesting <laughs> um <laughs> So anyway, but I, I think that I think that the wide this that that I think America, the one thing that stands out about it is that it's the most uh liberal thinking country in the world. In terms liberal, I mean like uh I'm isolated from everyone else. I start off as a private being, I don't start off as connected to the public. And I think that leads to this mass ability, mass availability of guns, which then makes that form of like 
destroying the other to destroy myself take the form of the mass shooting so that would be my kind of yeah spur of the moment uh, response to that mm -hmm. yeah. it's very interesting that you referenced prince harry because one of the controversies in the book was that he admits to killing 25 afghan uh, and mentioning that for him it was like uh, pieces on a chessboard like this total sort of dehumanization of the other and I think it's not a coincidence that he references now you know hearing you say that I think it's not a coincidence that that comes out now that he's out of England and in America in you know trying to popularize a book you know independent of the royal family that he's seeking recognition through violence right right absolutely now, yeah the Nick it's a really that's a good point I should have mentioned that right like the <clears throat> like the role that violence plays in rec in like what we recognize is really important, I think, because I, it's again, violence allows you to get recognition while satisfying this destructive drive. Right. So I think it's, a, it's, you know, certain way violence is, is perfect for that. Mm -hmm. If, if recognition is the betrayal of your drive, which I think it is. So violence yeah. allows you to both betray your drive and satisfy it at the same time, which is what makes it so nice. Yeah. I think. No wonder it's so prevalent. Right, 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 right. I mean, I meant nice in the sense of psychically, not. Yeah, so no, nice. it, I mean, it functions. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, 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 good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, politically too, it's such a, such politically, a. Politically, right, right. An important right. political tool for so many movements. Right. Yeah. And, right. and, but in America where everything's so fragmented, everyone's committing violence on such a individual level. You know, but I guess, yeah, the the um, the existence of guns and the extent that they do exist in America uh, doesn't alone explain the mass shootings. I feel like a lot of people no, no. leave it, right. leave it at that. Oh, and people also leave it at this uh, or simply like pathology, uh, pathologizing the, the person who commits it by saying they just right. they're somehow crazy or they they uh, ascribe to them like like a death drive. But like you said, it, the death almost doesn't matter in their, right. in their head. Plus, plus don't They're you think Tyler, that's, isn't that crazy? Because would it be that the U S has the monopoly on mentally ill people like that? That wouldn't make any sense at all. That, right? Yeah. Like whenever I hear that kind of crap, I always think like, really, have you, have you thought, thought about the issue for five seconds or like people that say it's violent video games. I think like, really like Japan, watch their video games compared to ours. They're like tiny times as violent. And they like five people get killed a year there with guns. If that many, like, so it's not even, there's this is, those arguments just are just stupid. They're just not even, you know, like they should not even get a hearing in the public. Someone should start to articulate that. And then everyone should just burst out laughing. Like, Oh, this fool. They're just so dumb. We, they don't, they can't help themselves. I'm sorry. You know, yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 so it's frustrating how how widely uh, widely or that that that's the the mindset that, that many people have, and it's I feel like yeah. psychoanalysis provides that that in right more... because of the idea of symptom, which is what you that's the nature of this whole question, right? right? Like the whole point is that the shooting is symptomatic of something, and mm -hmm. if you don't think of it that way, then you're not even thinking of it. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, yeah, but so you did mention that we th you thought we were going to mention QAnon. Uh, I. I we are going to mention social media for sure and uh, right wing enjoyment, which might inevitably lead into QAnon. But our question is, why are so many people radicalized by social media uh, into right wing enjoyment? And yeah, yeah, if you could just answer that, we have some. some yeah, isn't the but... nature isn't the nature of, of social media in a sense aligned with right wing enjoyment? Because yeah. it's, it's it's precisely. And it's 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 even it's better in a way because it's the promise of belonging without any of the feeling of belonging. So you're you're constantly enticed into like, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to join this group. I'm going to really. And then and then you're you if as long as you're online, you always feel still distanced from the thing. So you're 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 like, how can I commit myself even more? How can I do even more to really feel like I belong? So there there it's almost like this. Uh, you know, dog races with the little uh, rabbit that they put out in front of the dogs, right? Like it, they mm. can never get to it uh, because they're con they're constantly moving it forward. And I think that's the way social media functions. Like there's this sense of there, there's this promise of belonging, and I think the that's the right wing promise. So I think there's a real alignment with social media and right wing enjoyment in a in an absolute way. 
Right. And I think we've already established this in our previous questions when you were describing recognition as being uh, inherent to, to social media yeah, yeah. And, and that being also inherent to right wing or belonging in general. Um, yeah. yeah. I got a question particular actually to QAnon. Um, would you consider QAnon as a social media phenomena to be a psychotic form of right wing enjoyment? Yeah. 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 I think, uh, it's like, I think all of this paranoia and paranoia is a species of psychosis. So yeah. mm -hmm. absolutely. The question is, I have a friend who's working on a book, uh, on, on psychosis, right. And his QAnon is one of the chapters in his book. The question is, is all right-wing enjoyment psychotic? I mean, I don't think it is, but I think that could be a question, right? Because you sure. could like, like what, how do you avoid psychosis, right? You accept your castration. Mm -hmm. And so is right-wing enjoyment an attempted refusal of castration? Uh, I, maybe. So I think there, you can make the, I don't think I would say that, but I could see the argument being made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nick and I, Nick and I were talking last night about um, schizophrenia, uh, or at least the the clinical definition of schizophrenia is problematic as it might be. But uh, the and the correlation between the symptoms of that of that clinical uh, position and a QAnon subscriber, like a really in depth QAnon subscriber, and we we were struggling to find a difference between uh, their experience of the world, you know, yeah. uh, in in their sort of persistent they. they they've almost seemingly totally eliminated that distance between themselves and, and, and the text. And now they're living in this, in this completely disjointed uh, world where they're alienated from their social relationships. They, a lot of them can't hold jobs. Their kids hate them. Uh, a, a lot of similar outcomes of schizophrenia. Yeah. What isn't what's interesting though, the way in which their lives are schizophrenic, but their, their, their ideas are paranoid. So they kind of like bring together these two forms mm. of psychosis, right? Like, I think that's a, that's a very interesting, I did. I mean, look, you'd have to do, there'd be so, so much to say about that. I think in terms of, of psychosis and, 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 and QAnon, I think it's really, uh, and, and, and this friend of mine said, you wouldn't believe there's absolutely nothing, the writing on QAnon, none of it really touches on this, this question. And no one, no one in this dialectical, position that we yeah. share has mm -hmm. has tried to broach it so it would it, someone should do it i think because it's really i think there's such you know you'd have to really get into the material which would be a lot of work i think mm -hmm. because it's not it's not like q and on q didn't publish a book right like it's such, like freud had it easy because schraber just wrote a book and so you can just say okay i can just analyze this but it's, yeah. it's much harder i think so we're with, confused with q it's very interesting though because he you know, he gives his followers like a, a hermeneutics of Trump, like they're, you know, reading into his tweets and they're yeah. like, the, this capital letter means that, you know, something about, you know, cabals and pet, like he, it's this total, this created cosmology from, you know, signifiers and this total, the psychotic relationship to signifiers. Seemingly and, arbitrary signifiers. Right. Like the kafefe, right? Like that would be the great, do you know this thing that Trump yeah. put out this. It's a was it a tweet that just said kafefe or something? Uh, I don't even know what the exact letters are. People but were freaking out about it. it be, no, people. Everybody had like Nick said. They had all these crazy hermeneutics of kafefe. Like it, he was sending this coded message to us, and yeah. So it's it's yeah. it's amazing, right? Like it's a. I think hermeneutics is the is the proper word, right? Like it, which is is, is fascinating because there's. You and that's part of the way paranoia functions. Like you think mm. you're in on the secret. Like if you if you find yeah. get someone to give you the the key the the pass key, then you're in on the secret, right? The experience of uh, the QAnon follower believer reminds me a lot of uh, Ryan Engley's experience of psychosis after the traumatic experience, yeah. uh, where he couldn't or he, everything around him was artificial or fake. He he couldn't recognize uh, like the. Or he just felt as though he was living like he was creating his own reality, right? Uh, right. And this, and, and even outside Trump tweets, plenty of them follow like uh, are are really into numerology. So any number they see uh, anywhere, they'll like somehow interpret it and and turn it into some sort of stuff decipherable code. But uh, they have such skepticism, such paranoia that everything, their whole daily experience is suffused with with artificiality or, or fakeness. Right. Right. I mean, it's interesting because. In a way, they're right, you know. Like in a way, they're right. 
but they, what the, the problem is that they think that there's an agent behind the fake, like there's someone out there plotting the fake, right? And there's no, sorry, like it's all fake, but there's no agent creating the fake. All we have is the fake. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, there's no cabal. There's no cabal, right. Unfortunately. Exactly. And exactly. and in the case of the January 6th, there's no power doesn't really exist in the in the in the Capitol building or there's nothing nothing was there. Yeah. And there's all these like these erected enemies that they constantly are acting on, but but have no are constantly frustrated, frustrating yeah. themselves. Tyler, it's such a good point. I loved it. And, you know, it's the same thing happened in Brasilia, right? Like they yeah. there's all these photos and videos of these people smashing the window and they're like, there's no one there. Yeah. Like Lula's over in like Rio or somewhere. Like oh, isn't he in Florida or something for a while? Yeah, they, I well Bolsonaro. Yeah, Bolsonaro's in Florida. Oh, Bolsonaro's sorry. in Florida. But like there, there, there's a, like the real, I think it's a great point. I mean, someone should really talk about this because it's a real great example that at the heart of power is a void. Mm. Right. And and yet, and and but when people when you're paranoid, you don't think there's a void. You think there's like really something substantial there. And what they should have, like there should, there you could make a great movie about someone got to the Capitol and got inside and they realized no one was there actually. Like there was no one, there was nothing to take. Nothing's happening. That's a, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's you just like one big, uh, one big like, stage, a theater really. Right. But they can't recognize that. Man. Right, right. I know, that's why we like both. I'm sorry, Nick, go ahead. I was, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a shameless plug for our video on Baudrillard and hyper reality and the <laughs> phenomena of Trump and it ends with the Capitol and that sort of empty seat of power. Yeah. Yeah. Cause one of Baudrillard's points is that, or a lot of the, 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 the phenomenon that we see in contemporary society is just people mourning the death of power. I believe that's how he puts it. Um, and I, I believe he, he has a very like, He's very, he's very romantic about the past, so he believes that there was there was well, some see, substance that had existed. Right, right. I think that's why my use of the term pipsqueak, because I don't <laughs> I think that that's a I think that's wrong, right? Like I don't think I think that I think that we should always th you know uh you know when Marx says uh the the anatomy of the human is the key to the anatomy of the ape, right? Like I think mm -hmm. we should always think what gets revealed now is it like it's not that we're we've invented something new. It's that we're now discovering something yeah. that was always the case, right? And I think that's I think that's what's true about power, like that void at the heart of power. That's always been true. Like the like the king always had no clothes, right? Like that that mm -hmm. and he, then that the clothes were only a result of everyone's collective belief. And so I think that that's always been true, but it gets revealed today. So I think that's a really important. Distinction. I'm kidding about the pipsqueak thing. I just couldn't. <laughs> but th that is our one problem with Bojard Is is uh yeah. yeah he's not he's not thoroughly enough a, a a thinker of contradiction. But but yes, uh, we also agree. I, I think we anticipated you uh, responding by saying that QAnon was a psych psychotic form of uh, of enjoyment. Um, and we we're just we see QAnon this QAnon phenomenon is is something really important. I guess to to touch on. Yeah. Uh, and something that we 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 look to like to develop further, but we we noticed that, oh, at least I noticed that you were you had a slight aversion to talking about QAnon. Could you could you describe that? Or for for? Oh no for no, I didn't, I didn't, oh, I didn't, okay. I didn't, I didn't. I just I just assumed you were going to go that way, and I, I I was totally fine with that. Okay. I just I in fact I would say the opposite. Like it was kind of my wish. Yeah, no, I, I noticed. Yeah, you yeah. unconsciously wished. Yeah, so I was I was I wanted to talk about that. I would I, maybe my aversion was to talking about mass shooting because I thought I'd have as much to say about that. But no, I, I have no aversion on that QAnon. So I think you're absolutely right that it is in a certain sense one of the master phenomenon of our time, right? The phenomenon of our time, like it yeah, really, and it's only growing. Yeah, right, absolutely. And 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 what's interesting about one of the things interesting about it is the craziness of it is not an argument against it for any of its supporters. That is an argument for it. And I think I find it, you know, this argument that um, you, we, if you could go back in time and kill Hitler in his grave or not his grave, that was a funny slip in his, in his, in, in his uh, cradle, you shouldn't do it because a smarter person could have come to power in Germany and they would have realized, well, we shouldn't attack Russia. And then Germany would have won the war. Right. Mm -hmm. But, Part of me thinks that's completely wrong. Part of me thinks the stupidity of the leader like Trump, like the stupidity of the QAnon conspiracy, that is not just secondary material. That is integral 
it's primary to its appeal. Like it, mm -hmm. the more that it asks you to throw away your mind, the more it appeals to people. The more you like, can enjoy it, right? Yeah. Yeah. The more you can. That's what I was just thinking. Yeah. The more you can. Right. Enjoy yeah. I, I was. I want to bring up the 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 movie we just watched together, Nick. Perhaps you've watched it as well, Todd. Um, this place rules by Andrew Callahan. Oh, I haven't seen it. No. Good. Are you familiar with it at all? No, not at all. Yeah, it, it, it's just. Yeah. Yeah, it's on HBO okay. now. It's okay. this uh, famous YouTuber who who does um, interview format videos where he goes on the street and just interviews people. And he's developed his channel great. And HBO picked him up and asked him to do a whole documentary. And the documentary is on the weeks leading up to the January 6th riot. He's okay. known for interviewing like marginal people, weird, weird folk. And so it's and he was going to all the all the all the riots and, and all the, the rallies and whatnot. And he was interviewing people there. And he also interviewed um Enrique, what's his last name? Do you remember Nick? Tarantino, the, the leader of the Proud Boys. Yeah, oh. the leader of the Proud Boys. Who He's the leader of the Proud Boys, but who comes off as this highly cynical uh, profiteer. He's selling t-shirts. He even makes Biden t-shirts, believe it or not, and he sells them. Um, but, but people like him, uh, and particularly him, express this high, like high awareness uh, about the, the status of their enjoyment. So he was describing one of the, the particularly violent rallies at night, uh, I forget where it was, um, but either way, he, he was like, he was sitting back on his chair and he was like, I mean, think about it. I was smiling. My friends were smiling. The p police were smiling. Uh, Antifa was laughing. We were all having a good time. We were enjoying it. That's what he said. Wow. wow. Yeah. And, and the, uh, all, every, all the other profiteers, Alex Jones, they all had this sort of like awareness that like, they're able to profit off people's enjoyment and and that this ideology this right-wing ideology gives people license to enjoy and and buy stuff you know and buy stuff right i think that's interesting i mean that that to me shows the way in which cynicism and today's capitalism are absolutely aligned right like these are these are like what we think of as major right-wing political figures and they don't even it's like their belief is like totally secondary mm -hmm. what's primary is how can we profit on this thing right like that seems to be really important yeah and the movie that's sort of how it was its angle is that QAnon was uh fueled by people seeking to make a profit uh and there's a lot of interpretations of QAnon some people see it as like a psyop or something like that um but for whatever reason uh, but there's definitely no like substantive or I don't know there's there's no actual project to QAnon, QAnon. yeah yeah I know I I think that's right and I I think that that's that's true of the leaders but don't you think that I always find explain like how many millions of people start online things with the attempt to make a profit and then they don't right or they sure. or they make a, like what's what's interesting is why do all these people who aren't making a profit buy into it right like that seems to me and that that's I think what you guys are getting at with mm. QAnon and schizophrenia QAnon and paranoia so I think that's to me much more interesting question yeah. and that, sure. I think that's where psychoanalysis has a contribution to leftist political thinking, right? Like, cause it's, it's like, okay, you can always make this Marxist critique and say, oh, they're just doing it for the, the money, but that doesn't explain why all these people that aren't getting any money from it are following along, right? Mm -hmm. Like that seems to me is important. Well, and that's what's, you know, part of what's really interesting about it is that, you know, people enjoy the loss that they sustain yeah, right. in it. Like, you know, people, you know, enjoy through the, the family members that they won't see on Thanksgiving and the, you know, that this self-destructive aspect, I think that's one of the things I really loved about the documentary is it really highlights how the money people came out with the bag, you know, profiting handsomely and left all these true believers in the lurch at the Capitol enjoying and, yeah. you know, suffering for it. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of them did legitimately feel betrayed afterwards. They felt like they, they were manipulated. They felt like oh. they've been, yeah, they came to, they came to light after, after all that, political frisian had died down or they came to so they were able to see through but yeah. um yeah uh but yeah it, that's the more that's the more important question i i i'd agree um yeah. but uh do we have any other questions with QAnon, Nick, or? uh no that, that was our last q and on one mm -hmm. um i guess the next question we have on, on a you know actually a very similar sort of page is what is lacanian psychoanalysis teach us about modern and historical fascism and how to fight it. Well, I think it try the, the the main thing is it tries to say 
what is the fact what is the enjoyment benefit to fascism mm-hmm. and then how do you find a structure or make evident a structure of enjoyment opposite of that and i think that and i think it's only people i think one of the things that's pretty clear to me is that it's only under capitalism that fascism develops i mean obviously there are right-wing monstrosities earlier in history but fascism seems to me a particularly capitalist thing and i I think one of the things that it does is it promises modernity the benefits of modernity without the uh without the alienation that's inherent in modernity so it said so it says like oh you can have you can still have your car you can still have all this your your cell phone or your regular phone Mm -hmm. uh but you're not going to have to feel alienated when you're still going to have a community, even yeah. though capitalism destroys communities. So I think that that's, and I think that's a, to me, that's an insight perfect. If it's an insight perfectly in keeping with what Lacan has to say, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it really has this, you know, you can be a you know modern subject in the suburbs and you're totally isolated world and have the sense of community of like a, you know, a Templar crusader, you know, lived in the past and you know right right like it's the like it it really fascism is really an ideology of the best of both worlds right like you get you get both the benefits of modernity and then you get the benefits of traditional communal society right so i think that's the real the real idea Mm -hmm. and do you do you see fat do you see fascism as a a viable like category here in the united states is it possible uh oh yeah yeah, yeah. i think high, i mean i think i like yeah, debate between like whether i know yeah i know i mean i think i think look to me trump is the trumpist movement is if not fa- like quasi-fascist like it's 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 certainly moving in that direction i think that it it it, it promises community obviously the question is to what extent it wants to break down and i think it does like it wants to break down democratic processes and like it seems like they're all like we're seeing a string of these like bolsonaro i think if he had been reelected, we wouldn't have seen like democratic process in brazil would have disappeared modi in india erdogan in turkey like i think putin in russia like i think we're seeing a series of like, places where there were democratic processes in place and they they there's this move to authoritarian consolidation of power and then combined with an ethnic community forming around that like in india it's very clear that it's an ethnic it's very it's very hindu it's very hindu right like like if you're muslim then you're 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 really you're out and so i think there's really a sense of a community form and so but i think the same thing in america right like the and that's why I think the anti-immigration and the build the wall is so important, even though it's not, it's so unviable as a, as a actual practice, but it, that didn't even matter, right? Like the, the unviability of it is actually part of its appeal, right? Like the wall isn't going to really keep anyone out, but that, that didn't matter because fascism doesn't want to succeed in its project. I think that's a key that part that another thing that psychoanalysis has to say about fascism, that it doesn't want to succeed. Right. Like Germany doesn't want to ever exterminate every Jew. Right. Because yeah. if you don't have the threat of the Jew, then you the fascist community is it dissipates. It loses its coherence. Yeah. Right. So. That makes me think about um, inquis- inquisitorial Spain when they yeah. expelled the Jewish population and then they, you know, ostensibly had no more Jews and they created the figure of the crypto Jew and. You know, it's very sort of Sartre and the classic, like, if, you know, if the Jew didn't exist, the anti-Semite would make the Jew. Right, right, right. Uh, and I think that's, you know, part of the appeal of fascism is that it's the most sort of clear form of right-wing enjoyment of. Absolutely. This Absolutely. is the enemy. We have to, you know, right. exterminate them, kill them. Right. Subject. And, 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 it, and it's all, what's interesting is it's a right-wing form of enjoyment that privileges keeping the wheels of capitalism going right mm-hmm. like that's like it, it's community plus capital that's what, i think that's what fascism is community that's, plus yeah. capital that seems like a like icy hot uh, uh in 
yeah. right, 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 right. It doesn't work, right. but right. I, get, I, I, I always find your discussions on um, on what's happening to public spaces really interesting and how capitalism yeah. is sort of like shrinking them, ever shrinking them down. Uh, would you say fascism also uh, encourages that? Yeah, it's absolutely. Because it, of- it, 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 right, it, right. It has to throw one side out, right? Like there's, own, there's, there's plenty of community spaces under fascism, yeah. right? But those are not public, right? Mm-hmm. Like I think there's a, I think we tend to think, I really don't like the way the term community is floated around so much because mm-hmm. I think it's in here. For one thing, I don't think any community is like, I think every community is actually like divided against itself. So that's one. But I also think, there's a real opposition between the community and the public that every community is private. It's a, t- it's surrounded. It's, it surrounds a certain identity, a certain symbolic identity, and it may be a broad symbolic identity, but it's still a symbolic identity. Whereas what I like about the idea of the public is that it, 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 it you have to, you, your symbolic identity doesn't count in the public. Like that's the whole point of the of a public, mm-hmm. that it's just your, it's just your subjectivity. It's not your symbolic identity. So I think that's the, yeah, that's to like, me what's what's important. I like that distinction between a community and public. Yeah, mm. uh, it's, it seems important. Um, yeah, uh, anything else on fascism? I think I think we covered what we wanted to, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, do you want to ask the next question? Yeah. Uh, so fascism. Yeah, I, I, I suppose we, we can... So these are at this point grab bag questions. We, sure. Our our flow is, but uh, yeah. and we have done. The, I do want to mention we have done the one hour and, and thirty minutes. We have what three more questions, Nick? You'd say sure. Two? That's fine. Yeah, it's yeah. in two. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. Right. I, I apologize. My cat is climbing. Nah, no worries. I like cats. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Even um, through the screen, I like cats. It's fine. <laughs> they have that effect on people. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, what? What role we kind of already touched upon this with the QAnon and whatnot, but I, I'd like to talk specifically, I guess, about uh, perversion and and uh, we want to cover all the the, yeah. uh, the different discourses, I guess. But perversion in uh, what role does perversion play in modern politics? You had mentioned it, I think there's one mention of it in in, in your book, and you've mentioned it uh, in terms of the left wing sort of um, adopting radical transgress transgressivity or, or yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. radical transgression. Yeah. Is that being a, as that is a perverse position to have. Um, but I'm interested what you have to say about right-wing perversion and maybe if that oh, applies think, to fascism. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, interesting. Is, is fascism a right-wing perversion? I don't know about that. I'd have to think about that a lot. So that's a good question. Or not necessarily um, fascism, just any sort of right-wing perversion, if that's applicable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the left-wing is pretty easy, right? Like, I think it's it's like when you make transgression an end in itself on the left, perverse. Right. Right. That's mm-hmm. perverse. So I, and I think that does happen. It's not unusual. Uh, on the right. I think I wonder if if January 6th was perverse. Right. Because and I think it's like what we were talking about with the emptiness of the of the Capitol. Right. Mm-hmm. Like the the way that I mean, people were really there. But of course, the seat of power is empty. Right. Mm-hmm. That's the point. Uh, uh, it's interesting. Like, is is it an attempt is it a perverse act in the sense that it's an attempt to get the the law to show itself, right? Like, like I want to, we want to, I want to force the, I want to, like the pervert wants to, the pervert, sorry, <laughs> it was between yeah. saying perversion and pervert. Uh, the pervert wants to push the law to make itself known, like to make it, to make itself. And it, and it, and, it, and when it does that, it's, it gets off on the law, right? And so that's why it's only a, a semblance of a radical position because it gets off on the very thing that it's opposed to. So I think you might say that those mass events like January 6th in the US, January 8th in Brazil are are themselves perverse acts, right? Like I think that's a, I think you could, uh, I think that doesn't, that makes sense to me. That doesn't seem like a crazy kind of a, way to think of it yeah 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 I, for for nick and nick and i we were for a long time well a couple of months we were working on a perversion and, and fascism video but we just couldn't make it work uh it, like theoretically it was yeah it was, i'm not sure it does really but, yeah. it, but it, it's an interesting question because i think there you could there are ways in which i could see that working out but then there are other ways which i don't i think it's too 
I mean, I think that because it's too close to psychosis, I think that's the problem, right? Like mm. the problem is, I think it's much easier to do uh, uh, a paranoia and fascism thing mm. than to do a perversion. So yeah. I think it'd be harder. So It always felt like two puzzle pieces that they fit together, but they didn't actually match. Yeah, like, you know, yeah, you, yeah. Like, oh, no, cool. I know. I've done those puzzles where you, it, does, it does fit, but it doesn't exactly, yeah, the, the look yeah. of it doesn't seem right, yeah. Yeah, uh, but fair, fair enough. I, I think, I think we agree in general. The paranoia and f connecting paranoia and fashion is, is, is definitely interesting. Not something we we thought about before, but, um, but yeah. Uh, if you want to ask the second to last question, Nick. No, you you can go for it. Okay, all right. You, you, that's you the last question. I'm gonna. All right, I know you like the last. <laughs> question. Uh, okay. So, uh, which contradictions? This is. A, you can answer this however you want, but we just threw this in here. Which contradictions do you think will define U.S. politics in the next 10 years? And we've talked about a lot of interesting like uh, contradictions, mm -hmm. however you want to define that. But uh, in your mind, what do you think is the most important or defining? Um, yeah, I guess contradiction. The contradiction on the right. I think the contradiction between mm -hmm. uh, the Trumpist right wing position and the market right-wing position because i think there's a real i think there i think that contradiction they've covered it over in different ways mm -hmm. and and i think they have a problem because i think they're like these by trumpist i also include the abortion fanatics etc right. right right like so mm -hmm. so these people that are driven solely by the cultural uh question and then like the economic and i think it's a hard it's you know oftentimes people are like oh these people just don't know where their real interests lie i don't believe that at all but i do think it's interesting that the right has for a long time been able to hold itself together since reagan uh and i'm not sure i think there are certain i think it'll be i'm curious to see how long corporate america will be along that on the right wing bandwagon right is mm. because i think that I, I you start to see little fissures right this like uh their term of disapprobation what is it, it they say uh woke capitalism mm -hmm. which of course i don't think exists but the, the point is that any kind of attempt by capitalist entities to not be racist or not be sexist or not be homophobic uh is seen as a affront to to conservatism or to the the sure. different identities that occupy that position so i that to me i mean look i i, I think you could equally say the the contradiction between liberalism and leftism but i i think i some i i think that that the left is so weak in the u.s i'm not sure that that would be the thing i think it's on this division this contradiction that inhabits the right so that's what i would say we would love for that one to be the defining all right I, that's right exactly exactly <laughs> you know one. nick i think that's right like you could say like Privileged is the group that has its contradiction as the defining one, right? Like they're at a good position. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What you said reminds me of the the fight between Disney and um the Florida. Yeah. The yeah. 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 That's absolutely it, right? Like whose side do you want to be on in that? Like I'm not on Disney's side in anything. So I'm not taking Disney's side. I'm obviously not on DeSantis' side. So it's just it's like you're like Mercutio, you know, a plague on both their houses. Like I don't want to, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it, it, that's a particularly interesting one because traditionally capitalists and right wing folk were 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 on the same side, but but I guess yeah. right wing folks are just getting too right wing for capitalists. Well, because it gets in the way of profit, right? Like, yeah. I mean, it is a thing, right? Like, if you if you if Disney said, you know what, we're going to make sure our parks are completely homophobic, so that when you when the rightists come down, they'll feel safe. I also think, by the way, we should on the left appropriate the term snowflake for as a, as a term of derision for right. For Absolutely. Sure. I think mm -hmm. we should never, we should never allow leftists to be called snow. Like it's only the right. It's the snowflake. Yeah. Like why can't we teach the history of racism? Oh, okay. Sorry. The right wing snowflakes can't stand right. to hear what real U S history was. We just want to teach the truth of U S history, but we can't, they call it critical race theory. They made up this thing. Which is a legal term in law, but they does they because they don't they can't handle the they're like you know Tom Cruise and a few good men they can't handle the truth like I think we should absolutely use those kinds of terms of derision for the right so that would and, uh, I'm into that I think. Yeah. yeah anyway for sure yeah. 
Yeah, the right could use. I mean, the right, I guess, I suppose, get their their worth, their 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 fair share of derision, but not the right kind of derision. That's not the, the right kind, right? Like snowflake, like that. Like that's a it good is one. true, right? Like, isn't it? Aren't they about this history question? Like, well, how else do you describe it? Like, yeah. Yeah. oh, we have to have a sanitized version of history because we don't want to have slavery taught. That's makes us feel bad. Right. You know, so yeah. Well, it's, it's this immense sensitivity to difference, you know, the, I mean, right. the whole, and it's a big part of the animating the anti trans, you know, anti non binary, anti sort of queerness that has, you know, grown and proliferated is this absolute intolerance of difference in the same way that a snowflake can't handle changes in temperature they, right, you know. right 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 they'll melt right yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah i think I, I like that i like that answer uh uh i'm gonna i'm gonna keep that in my mind and and, and whatnot but you want to ask the last question, Nick? I think that's a great. I think that's a great place to wrap things up. Honestly, oh, you don't want to ask oh, the last that, question. That, that the question the last I wanted question. to ask. Uh, what's that? That was the question I wanted to ask. Oh, let's see if we got it mixed up. No, yeah, we can ask okay. the last question. So the last question that we had, um, the, the one that um, was, what is lack from a Lacanian perspective? So it's the division between unconscious and conscious between subject of the enunciation subject of the enunciated it's the it's the constitutive non-having that constitutes my desire so i don't have i can't ever have any object that's satisfying that's what makes me a lacking subject mm -hmm. so that's that's how yeah. i put it like a, like that and that, and that and that i my enjoyment is constituted through what i this movement of my desire not through what i get and i think that's so that's and that what's that's what makes me a, a figure of lack but it's that i'm divided that's i'm always divided yeah. between like what i am and what i say between what i when, when I, my unconscious and my consciousness all these that these kind they're all they all map onto each other i think but those that's the thing like i'm I'm lacking because I'm divided and I can't ever heal that division. So I'm lacking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of a gap. Yeah. Our subjectivity and our connection to universality, it sounds like. Yeah. 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 That's all those things. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's what that's what we were looking for. Yeah. Okay. And it's a great place to to quilt it. Yeah. Sounds good to me, guys. It was great talking to you. I really appreciate it. Likewise, it's a pleasure to have you on. We we appreciate it so much. And uh, if if hopefully we can do it again some sometime. Anytime, anytime. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next. Take care. See you. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you.